standing in the splendour of Buckingham Palace, the Prime Minister is perhaps more than usually agitated. He has been at pains to explain himself and the thinking of the government at this week's audience with the Sovereign. Very good, Prime Minister. Thank you. Yet the PM wants to press a point. He hasn't got what he wants from the monarch and tries to negotiate. A hand reaches down onto the table. A button is pressed. A quiet but urgent message sounds outside the room in the palace. The door opens. A royal official enters. <clears throat> Prime Minister, thank you, Majesty. He bows, walks backwards a few steps out of respect and leaves. We cheer. Whether it's at the cinema, on the telly or in the papers, we Brits love our royal family. Why is that? Well, every culture points to certain things and says, if you gain those, if you acquire or achieve those, you are valuable. So, for example, traditional cultures celebrate family and children. In individualistic cultures, it's a fulfilling career, self-determination. Now, despite the differences between these two worldviews, every culture says the same. Affirmation of who you are is based on your performance, your achievement. And we Brits love our royal family because they seem to represent the best of both. There's the legacy of family, coronation, history, going back to Knights of the Round Table, that sort of thing. It's romantic. And in our modern era, they fit with public celebrity, the clothes, the looks, the money. We see them as achievement without having to work for it. What are some of the key moments in the life of a monarch? Well, we've had some recently. Coronation, the crown and the robe. There are public events being seen on the balcony. There's knighting people that are kneeling in front of you. You've got a sword. They're sitting on the throne, the golden chair. Jesus says, if you live for performance and achievement, it won't ever be big enough or bright enough. Somebody loves me or I've got a good career are fine. But if anything goes wrong with that relationship or that job, you fall apart. And the same can go for coming to church. You might be tempted to think that I'll know I'm a good person because I'm spiritual. But Jesus doesn't want us simply to shift from one performance and achievement based identity to another. So here we are at the feast of Christ the King. We set ourselves up to enter the waiting and uncertainty of Advent, to enter that time again, knowing that Jesus is King. What difference does that make? In the conversation with Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not from this world. My kingdom is not from here. That Jesus is King means we can stop the fatal obsession with ourselves, the the perpetual spiritual narcissism of putting my needs, my concerns, my priorities at the centre of my story. We are so prone in and out of the church to looking in and down. But Jesus is king. Where do I look? Look, he is coming with the clouds. The very presence of God in the pillar of cloud. In Daniel's vision, he says, as I watched, as I watched. The sense is of looking up. Jesus is on the throne. He is high and lifted up. He is holy, holy, holy. That Jesus is king means we look up and we look out. That Jesus is king also means you can't come to him negotiating. Like the PM pushing his luck, getting ended by the button. It's a way of saying that you know best. So as with Jesus, if you try to negotiate, I will give you this part of my life if you give me that. You're not recognising him as king. You and I must bow before the king. We are subjects and simply say, command me. But then that Jesus is king means that his answer is a whole new way. 
Stop negotiating. Stop being the little kings of the city-states of your life. Instead, you and I may rely on his performance and achievement to take us through life. It's not about striving to achieve mastery of your life. Instead, it's seeking to acknowledge the author of life as your master. The kingship of Jesus. What's it like? Well, if he is to us the king with a button that he presses when he's done with us, if he's only a king like that, on a throne, as it were, calling all the shots, you would submit because you have to, out of fear. We see the kingship of Jesus most vividly where he is higher and lifted up as a king on a cross. In place of coronation robes, he was stripped. His own robe gambled for by the soldiers of the guard. Instead of a golden crown, his was made of thorns. Instead of being cheered as a celebrity, he was jeered by the crowds. In place of knighting people, he was run through with the sword of an invader's army. This king went to the cross for you. He died so you can be forgiven. This king is one who serves you. But that was not the end. The genius of the cross is that it made death the pathway to life. He defeated sin and death so his kingdom of life would be permanently established on earth as in heaven. All things are being made new. He now sits on the throne of the universe more dazzling than any gold. He reigns as king over everything in the cosmos and he will return to put everything straight. The king has instructed all the palace authorities to know the quiet but urgent message that you are loved by the king of the universe. Do you know that Jesus loves you? The palace is getting dark and we've been talking for well over an hour. The monarch and the visitor are sitting together, looking and listening to one another. As the one who's done most of the talking, you find yourself wondering if this king will reach over for the button on the table. But it's unpressed. You get to stay. In fact, you're invited to stay overnight in the palace, to eat with the family. The invitation is actually more than that. It is to live there, to join the family. This is the king we can know today. If only we would look up and out from ourselves. Stop negotiating. Reach up and take in your hands the crown of your own life. Say, King Jesus, Whatever you ask, I will do. Whatever you send, I will accept. I place my life, my identity in your hands. I trust you, my King. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen.